um, what many of us researchers really want to get uh, our research out to a wider audience. So, but many of us also kind of lack the knowledge and skills on how to do it in an effective way. So we are trying then to get researchers to work in a more strategic and systematic way on how to uh, communicate uh, and reach out to policymakers. I titled my pres presentation or um, whatever it's called uh, Walk the Talk. So uh, the research policy interaction something. Walk the Talk. So that's actually what I think we, we should start doing that. I know it's like 3 a.m. for uh, Miguel and Hannah and so on. So let's have them. And I would like you to walk over to this end of the room. I thought we would uh, start to, uh, to discuss a little bit. Okay. First, I would like us just to take stock about what we uh, just heard. Gunnar said, we are punching way below our, below our waist. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, okay. <laughs> That's a different one. <laughs> okay, wait. We can punch harder and higher up. Uh, so, if you now reform a line, right? So, if you think that the EFD is uh, totally successful, we're doing all we can and we're really having a great policy impact, you would stand over here. If you think you're not successful at all, then you would stand over here. And then if you're somewhere in between, you... Somewhere in between. Yeah, you're Do you mean specifically in terms of the policy interaction communication or yeah. generally? Not how well you're doing on research, but okay. policy impact and how well you're interacting with, uh, with the policy side. Let's hear um, Miguel here. You're in the middle. In the middle. In Concepcion. Yeah, because we, all, we always think that we can improve the thing that, that we, we are doing. And I think that we can especially uh, get uh, more coordination in the thing that we, mm. we do. Mm. And think more strategic. Because mm -hmm. uh, the thing that, what, that we, we are doing now is very related with the result that, okay. that we, we are doing. Okay. So it's, uh, it's a more decentralized uh, mm. way of doing this. <laughs> okay. Um, good. And, and we have um, Maria Angela. Angelica. Angelica, yes. yes. <laughs> Please. Costa Rica, your... Well, I believe we have uh, going through a process and, and, and with effort and, and trying to use the tools we have. We have uh, we, we still have to improve, it, but we have managed to to you have come some way. to be yeah. in, in communication and, and being a yeah. point of reference. Mm. For for the government agencies and and, and other uh, um, private sector and universities to to look how how we have done some research and, and yeah so we we're getting there we have done a lot of work and I don't know examples for example um, yeah we we have been working with the national park system for quite some time we managed to have some inputs of our research over there. Uh, colleagues have been working on the water sector also in a regional level and they are a point of reference also on water issues. There are other sectors we need to improve a lot, but there are certain examples that we can pick and we can say, yeah, we have been successful on, on this and that. Good. Yeah, good, so you can learn from each other here, from the centers that have done more or that feel that they have been successful and so on. But of course, the, the success the actual policy impact, so it's not only dependent on what you as centers can do, but a lot of the context, right? What are the constraints? How much are, is it friendly? Are they interested in getting advice on something? Or are they just interested in uh, in, in pushing their own policies? Uh, so I see, uh, Pete, uh, you are uh, very, uh, <laughs> and we know a little bit now about the current context in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, which is also uh, uh, maybe welcoming for scientific advice. I don't know, but uh, are you there for past successes? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, so uh, there's a, there's a couple of, uh, of things. You know, first I was just echoing what you said. Uh, where we have had impact has taken a long time. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of uh, persistence and presence, uh, uh, and it, it builds on itself. And there's a mix, I think, of. I wish we were just having a plan, executing the plan, and having impact, but it's 
this, this dialectic of strategy and op opportunistic, uh, sometimes taking advantage of things you've done years before. Now, in the U.S. case, uh, you've noticed there's been some changes lately, uh, but what we're very fortunate is there's a lot of venues in America where you can actually have impact. It's not just the federal government. There's a lot of activity going on at state and regional levels, and we're seeing a lot of interest in that, and we're seeing a lot of just non-government actors stepping up, even the private sector, interested in what you have to do. So you, you look for where, uh, two things, even areas where you think people aren't listening, there's other areas where they are. There's other things where the, the polarization and the hostility isn't there, and you can work, work there. And then you can look for other venues uh, to uh, keep your momentum going, keep building those connections and, and those networks and learning, because uh, you have more credibility when you understand the, the constraints that the policy makers are facing. So that's how we navigate that. Thing. So, uh, and for me personally, I think you can definitely not leave the communication and interaction work just to uh, the communication side. The researchers need to be involved, and I think a lot is not. Uh, I mean, policy days as well, you can show off well, one day of the year, but you need to have this kind of networking mentality and get to know the policy makers, the staff working, the civil servants, what are you working on now? And so they start to trust you and you link up with people. And that's only the researchers, or I mean, you need to have the researchers doing that. So, and uh, now, uh, imagine that you are a researcher, or you, I mean, some of you are researchers, and, and all of you are working with researchers. So, uh, if you think it's mainly risks, or perceive that there are a lot of risks involved in, or costs involved in uh, engaging with uh, interaction and so on, then you stand over there, and if it's mainly opportunities, you stand in that uh, side. I and want us to think. Um, about try to identify some of these costs that researchers normally uh, think of when they are when you come and ask them to engage in this and that activity or, or something like that. So um, um, let's say hallelujah. What would you say are, are some of those risks? I was actually in the middle. Yeah, but you are kind of uh, have identified one or two at least. Okay. I actually don't consider that exactly or as a, a cost. risk or a cost. To your research career. <laughs> yeah. But let me think. I have to think hard. <laughs> so, in terms of cost, it has to be maybe like sometimes we consider um, if it's if, if it's not uh, policy relevant. Actually, everything is policy relevant, but if it's not that much important. We might not like uh, contact. Uh, policy makers or ministries like, to take part in our like conference because like they might come and you might see like something repetitive and they might not come for something very uh, important one. Ah, so the researcher wouldn't go to the policy conference because it's not that relevant. Yes, I mean if you invite them like, the four research. or five times in a year and they might consider like a person uh -huh. couple like, or not. I can consider that as a reason. So, not uh, relevant for the research. Not academic relevant. Mm -hmm. Not relevant. Not for the research, ah. but for the academic. Okay. Yeah, good point. Okay, let, let me hear a few more risks. Uh, Miguel, you were you were trying to balance this in your self channel. Because you cannot let them just uh, be there and have a meeting dream uh, once a year. You have to be with them and you have to support them. Uh -huh. That means that you usually get, have to get involved in the issue that they are doing. Yeah. So you have to uh, spend some time uh, uh, evaluating the project that they are conducting usually uh, 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 giving inputs mm -hmm. to some proposal uh, uh, that they are uh, yes. implementing. So you have to be with them. Okay. That is, is time consuming. Ah. Well, 
and uh, that's and this is yeah. not something that you can put into your academic career. Yeah. So. Okay, could you expand? You cannot push on that on, in your academic career. It's not rewarded, or yes, it's not rewarded. Okay. So it's something about incentives. Yeah. Hannah, what would you like to add to this list? Sure. Um, I think there's quite a bit of overlap in topics that make sense, but it's not always immediate. So you have um, a policymaker, a practitioner that's interested in. Like how does this one technology? How do we explain this one technology is better than another? Whereas an academic wants to view more of the um, uh, landscape or how it how it actually presents itself, and so kind of pushing one agenda versus the research agenda that you're trying to, to have. So some kind of different dynamics. Dynamics, yeah. Goals, the the yeah. Okay. What else? Do, do um, all researchers enjoy uh, presenting and communicating in a simplified language? <laughs> I still love people. it. <laughs> uh, I mean, people hate it. Uh, so really, I, I mean, you get misinterpreted and you get, uh, you know, uh, press officer puts another heading that you don't like, uh, things like that. Um, I would add that. <laughs> Uh, how to frame that, but okay. And uh, I also think that researchers they have um, a pressure when they communicate with the policymaker because uh, if the idea your research is a uh, sharp result would be used in policymaker, it will have a huge impact on many people. So they have to think carefully to transfer the idea to the policy maker. Ah, so if you have done research and then it's picked up by the policy maker and they implement this policy and you are wrong, then you are kind of causing harm. Yeah, right. Of course. Okay. Um, so you can think very carefully. Okay, and I mean, and it can also be, I, I mean, it, it's a fact that many, I, I mean, on the policy side, you have your idea what you want to do, and then you find a piece of re research to legitimize what you were already pl planning to do. So you would be kind of an alibi for something, and it might not be kind of 100% exactly what you suggested, right? So you're an alibi. You know, um. Yes? I mean, this is a risk, but I say more maybe not from directly from the research perspective, but sort of the general credibility. Having worked on the cinema on the policy side, policymakers are usually on a very tight decision schedule. Mm -hmm. um, if they invite a particular researcher or an organization to present something practical, mm -hmm. and they are getting the research speech, not but their policy speech, they can actually very quickly decide that this organization and research will not be reinvited. And they just mm -hmm. find someone else to replace. So it's also a risk that if it's not well prepared, it could have long-term consequences. Um, if you fail. Yeah, <laughs> in terms of credibility. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, there might not be too many dialogues on the national level in a particular area, so it's very important that you manage and prepare well for that dialogue. I, I'm bringing this up to, to say, this is, I think, something we have to, to consider when we think about uh, creating this, uh, well, institutionalizing research policy interaction, that incentives do not always align. Yes? I have one more risk that's yes. very uh, central to RFF, and it's this balance between being objective and this arbiter and being a policy creation of policy innovation, and people are very reluctant to become cheerleaders for a certain policy. Uh, let's say you want to, I used to work on uh, road pricing, mm -hmm. and I was always asked right off ed to say why road pricing was the best thing to do. At the same time, I was trying to get funding from the government to evaluate a certain road pricing project, and so mm -hmm. I would shy away from wanting to mm -hmm. get pegged as a cheerleader or an advocate or something, so I think navigating that uh, promoting certain policy approaches at the same time as, as 
giving your credibility to someone who's objective. So now you are the communicator. Frame this in one or two words. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, uh, stepping into advocacy. Yeah. Pete, yeah. I have a few. Yeah. Advocacy. Advocacy versus analysis? Yeah. 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 Ah. You could think of this at the individual level, and then at the group level, or at the center level, or the department level, it's, it, it's a lot of culture, I think, to create a culture of uh, that this is also part of the job, right? And then at the higher level, you're also talking about incentive systems, like how is the academia set up to reward this type of work as well. So I think at the individual level, it's a part of an issue of skills. You can learn how to communicate by you know, engaging with good people like you, right? And you become less afraid and you practice and you, you get more comfortable and so on. But it's also about a will and um, kind of inner motivation. I think many people get into research from the start that they want to contribute and do something and, and have an impact and so on. And then you get into the system and you know you have to produce papers and so on and it's, it can get lost. So, but when we do this training, we work a bit on motivations of, of uh, and especially PhD candidates and, and young researchers. What kind of researcher do you want to be? You know, and maybe it also is a part of your career that you start. You know, you have to finish your PhD and you have to build a reputation or, or have some publications in order to even be invited to those tables, right? So it might take different different uh, steps. You can get access to data and research materials, right? Uh, new research ideas. Uh, you get an opportunity to present uh, at policy stakeholder workshop seminars. You get invit inv invitations to uh, advisory boards, government commissions maybe, media debates if you like this. I mean, this is of course an opportunity. You can be a membership in research funding, research policy com committees, and so on. And you get esteem, recognition, and influence, maybe. So um, we sent out this uh, guide, Stakeholder Interaction in Research Processes, a guide for researchers and research groups. And the background for this is the training we have done now for starting actually at the Department of Economics, where <coughs> It was financed by SIDA and, and all these uh, PhD candidates, well, they were going to go back and work and have an impact on policy. So we were asked to develop a course, this is 10 years back, uh, on that. And then we have developed that into different type of training courses. And we do it also for uh, research groups and so on. It also draws on our practical experiences of having this help desk for SIDA on advising them on uh, different kinds of climate change and environmental issues. So that's another type of policy interaction tool. You institutionalize a collaboration, contractual collaboration with the government agency and they can ask you for advice, things like that. And some, some other background uh, goes into this. And it was also based on a smaller research project where we looked at and we surveyed researchers. How did they interact with policy? and uh, when in the research process and so on. Um, and the uh, kind of point of departure for this work, we also survey the literature, of course. There are some good books. Uh, this one by Fred Carden, Knowledge to Policy. He was the evaluation officer or in command of IDRC. And he drew, drew up on, I don't know, 20 years of research um, where they were also trying to interact with policy and so on and trying to Kind of summarize that. Um, this is a more recent book, uh, The Research Impact Handbook by Mark Reed, who is a researcher in the UK who is focusing and doing a lot of trainings on this. A very good website, he does that podcasts and everything. Very good. Uh, basic point of departure analyze the context of your research. And this is important in the EFT. Our contexts are so different, you know, from the US to India or Kenya and so on. This is really. And, and it also matters what research area you're in, right? And what research you are doing. So you, I think, basically, it's too broad to do it on a central level. You need to go down to your specific research areas to see what are the policy processes and stakeholders in that research area, not only kind of at a broad national level. 
and you need a strategy, you need to have a long time perspective and be persistent and opportunistic because there will be windows when, uh, well, when there is a bigger openness for uh, listening to your research and taking it in. Uh, and there will be times where opportunities are not there. So you need to have uh, be a bit opportunistic. We also survey kind of <coughs> literature. There's a lot of literature about this so-called research policy gap. Um, um, I mean, we can. The first thing I read about this actually when we started was a, a small piece by David Glauer, who was working with this. Uh, he was for IDRC. He's an environmental economist working with the Asian network on environmental economics. So he wrote about this gap and you should never meet, or what were the differences? You know, you have these different perspectives, timelines, values, and so on. Um, there's a literature on that. We will not uh, dwell on that now. Um, we also, in this research we did, we identified kind of two kind of archetypic models. Uh, where the traditional one is the transfer model. You are kind of a researcher, this is kind of the Eiffel, uh, ivory tower. Kind of. you, you, you do your problem formulation, you produce your knowledge, and then you're ready to communicate. And then you contact your communication staff, and you do a press release or different events, and you communicate that to stakeholders. But you don't want to be influenced too much here because you, you, can, uh, you can be biased and things like that. You want to be objective all the time. So this is kind of on the one extreme, and on the other one is the interaction model where you want to have, discuss with stakeholders, when you formulate your research questions, in the problem formulation, and in the knowledge production, maybe you get data from stakeholders, you get feedback in that process also, and in the communication of the results. Uh, and of course, here you have a broader variety of things you can do and how you interact with stakeholders. And I think most are in somewhere in between this. These are two kind of idealized things. And the most kind, you talk about co-production even, where you kind of, uh, even stay, uh, some civil servants can be part of the research project. Um, so that's also uh, part of this guide. But now, uh, most important is to plan for uh, policy interaction. You have the country needs, so, so to say, environment and development priorities. This is part of the research policy, or policy research reviews to kind of see what are the policy processes going on? What are the kind of windows of opportunity? When will there be a decision <coughs> on the new energy strategy for China? If you come after that, well, it might be closed for five years, but maybe when you're developing that strategy, there will be appetite for advice. So looking for those things. And what are the key stakeholders who are developing that energy strategy? And then you have to meet that with your research themes, your history, uh, your capacity. What are the researchers' kind of skills? If you have been working on forestry, all your life, and then you see a process uh, about whatever, malaria or health or something, maybe it's, it's not that researcher that will do that work. So you have to somehow match, of course, your capacity and history with, with that um, thing, and based on that develop a plan. And that was the instruction for your research, policy research reviews. Uh, both the policies to research and implication and then to focus and then as I understand the next step is to do an action plan right um, we got some money from the university to start this uh, should be global and tackle global challenges and so on. we focus on mixtures uh, chemical pollution and things like that it's not so important the context here but um, it was rather easy for us from the top of our head to just list the center director, this professor in ecotoxicology, he came up with this long list of stakeholders, just like that. And I said, no, no, uh, we want to uh, take this group and see uh, and work with them. So we, um, we did this exercise. Uh, we had some stakeholders, there were some policy entry points, what could the contribution of the center be? and then some comments, and well, it's just one way that 
to involve uh, colleagues in doing uh, this kind of work. Okay, so um, there was, for example, here, United Nations Environmental Program. They are developing a new global chemicals outlook. Uh huh. And the second one, and um, maybe and they are asking uh, for uh, review papers. So maybe that's an entry point for us. We want to be a global center and have a global impact. Maybe we can do something with them. We had already had some contacts. Uh, so based on that stakeholder uh, listing, you can, for example, use a tool like this, where you, eat, you, you map those stakeholders with high interest, and then their influence on policy processes. Right? So we identified, for example, UNEP, they have large interest, but are well, rather influential, but not that influential. And these are the European Chemicals Agency and so on. So we said, with these we can maybe collaborate. Here we have the, 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 the Chemical Industry Association. <laughs> they are very uh, interested, probably, and they are very uh, influential, but we want to keep them a bit outside uh, our center activities in the start because we know they can come in and capture ag agendas and so on. So we will inform them but not involve very actively, etc. So, um, and then examples then of spin off projects. Now we are working with two review papers or three review papers for this report. And one of those is on economic policy instruments for chemicals management that we are elaborating with some of the researchers here in, in the EFT. But then, the, so the challenge is to move from a broad listing of processes and stakeholders to, okay, what should we actually move into and do? 